Thank you for downloading this Council on Foreign Relations video. CFR is an independent national membership organization and nonpartisan research center. For more information, please visit us online at CFR.org. Good evening. I don't know if it's the subject matter or these exciting panelists, but this is a standing room only audience, and welcome. We're glad to have you. This is the second in a series that's called Foreign Affairs Live that we are doing. Uh, on the analysis and opinions that we're running in the magazine. And as you can tell, the subject this time is one very much on everybody's mind, which is what's going on in the financial and economic world, both here and around the globe. Uh, we're joined tonight not only by the people who are in the room, but by national members who are electronically linked up, and some of them even are already sending in questions for our panelists when we get to that. Um, before we do get to it, I just wanted to mention that um, we uh, have, in addition to uh, members of the council here, we have subscribers to the magazine beyond the list of members and other friends of the magazine, and welcome to all of you. I should mention that the uh, content of foreign affairs uh, is now archived, and it goes back to 1961. They're available at home on the web. Uh, among the things that are available, since we are in this very exciting transition period, are two articles from a series of eight that we ran in the summer and fall of, 19, of 2007 by all the major candidates, Republican and Democratic, for the White House. Uh, Barack Obama's piece was run in the July-August edition of 2007. And since she was still a candidate then and is now about to be Secretary of State, you can see what Hillary Clinton's views were on foreign policy in her piece of November and December 2007. You have uh, with you full descriptions of our very distinguished panel, so I won't take up time on that. We have to my immediate left is Roger Altman. He's Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Evercore Partners and former Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Treasury. Next to him is James Grant. He is owner and editor of Grant's Interest Rate Observer. He's the author of After the Crash, Helping the U.S. Economy Write Itself, <clears throat> which we ran in our uh, November and December issue. Roger's piece is upcoming, as is Harold James. Harold James is professor at Princeton University, his piece is a twofer. He has, it's a big, long book essay on Martin Wolf's newest book, so we get both some opinions of Martin Wolf and I assure you some of Harold James. Just to give you a, um, a flavor of what these gentlemen um, are thinking about our current situation, just look at their titles of their pieces, uh, which I have in here somewhere, but... The Great Crash of 2008, that's Roger Altman. And um, after that is um, Jim Grant with After the Crash, Helping the U.S. Economy Write Itself. And finally, uh, Harold James and Martin Wolf, The Making of a Mess. Who broke global finance and who should pay for fixing it? Let me just start with... Um, just a few, a snippet or two of statistics to give you a sense of the dimensions of what we're going to be talking about tonight. It is truly a financial apocalypse that we have on our hands. Oil, which is in less demand thanks to the contraction of business around the globe, has fallen to about $50 a barrel. That's the lowest since 1997. Uh, then we have more Americans filing for unemployment benefits last week than in any week since 1992. Give you some sense of the deflation of asset values, Citigroup, which was very much in the news this morning and will be for some time, was in 2006 valued at $274 billion. It's now $26 billion. Now, what caused all this? We're not going to go into all the rules, but Roger points out in his reasons, points out in his piece that for too long we had too low interest rates trying to gin up the growth rate here, and that was coupled with um, 
a large amount of liquidity that had some place had the, was under pressure to go get higher uh, returns. The regulatory framework during this period of time clearly failed to uh, limit the abuses. And the bottom line of that is that the financial system ultimately collapsed. It has now spread uh, its venom, so to speak, into the real economy. And that indeed has gone global. So that's where we are now. And let me uh, just start with a question for Roger. Um, is, this, is, is the Obama plan enough? Can we tell yet? And is it in time? And by in time, I mean we're going to be lucky to get it by the, as he announced, he's going to try and get the con con Congress to work on it starting in January so that by the time he comes into office on the 20th, he can move with some alacrity. Well, first of all, Jim, I don't think we know uh, uh, nearly enough yet about what the plan will be. Uh, but what we do know is encouraging, namely the likely size of it and scope of it. And uh, Obama advisors have pointed to the 500 to 750 billion right. range in terms of uh, a bill they would like to see passed, as you just said, right off the bat for stimulus purposes. It's absolutely clear that we need uh, a very large stimulus effort uh, as soon as possible, and uh, that is a really large one by historical standards. Uh, so uh, I'm encouraged by the apparent size of it, uh, but we don't yet know, for example, how fast it would spend out, and that would depend on the components of the plan and how much of it were, uh, for example, in the form of unemployment uh, extension, food stamps, tax rebates, and so forth, which tend to get into consumers' pockets quickly as compared, for example, to infrastructure and various forms of investment which tend to spend out more slowly. So when we actually see the plan, you'll be able to make some judgments about how much of it is classic stimulus, uh, i.e. received quickly and available to be spent quickly, and how much of it is more investment-oriented spending. But the first indication, the size, is a very good one. Now, normally it takes the Congress a long time to do something of this dimension. Uh, this is, of course, uh, a crisis, and both houses of Congress are under democratic control. Um, are you fairly confident that they can move with some dispatch once they are presented this at the first of the year? Yes. Uh, I think it's going to be very difficult, and that's for good reason, for uh, almost any members of Congress, and let's particularly focus on the Senate, where uh, we know the rules are different, to oppose this. So I would expect it to pass very expeditiously. And this point you alluded to, uh, namely that Congress works on it starting January 5th or 6th, when it's constitutionally right. seated at the new Congress, and in effect has it ready for immediate action when Obama becomes president, is really an important one, because yeah. it, it then could pass days after his inauguration uh, and happen almost immediately. And that, that's, that's an encouraging possibility, I think. But I think it will absolutely pass and, not, and it won't be, won't be difficult and it won't be close. Now, before we get there, we've got a couple of big problems to deal with right in front of us, one of which sort of exploded at the end of last week. They worked all weekend over it. And so we have yet another bailout plan for Citigroup some $20 billion, and then guarantees up to, what, $350 billion or so for toxic assets. One headline I saw in, I think, the Financial Times this morning is that Citibank is breaking itself up into two banks, good Citibank and bad Citibank. And bad Citibank they're going to give to the government. Uh, let me ask Jim. <laughs> let me ask Jim. Um, what do you think of the, uh, of the bailout of Citibank? And are... Can we expect other financial institutions now to get in line and ask for some of the same kind of treatment? Or is this sui generis? Sui who? <laughs> <laughs> sui City. Are they so special that... <laughs> um, City is a special case. Citibank is a rogue bank um, and has been for some time. In the day, and I'm talking now about 1857, uh, uh, <laughs> 
The city was almost put out of business uh, through the uh, short-sightedness of its management. Uh, a fellow named Moses Tyler took it over, owned most of the stock, ran it to such a degree of prudence that it was known derisively by the examiners as a timid bank for timid people. Uh, uh, James Stillman came along, who had the most imperious way of saying no. Those are the golden years of city. <laughs> uh, tragically, they learned to say yes uh, about the time of Walter Rifton, and the yes has become more and more emphatic until such time as a fellow named Chuck Prince, carefully supervised by Robert Rubin, um, got it into his head that a banker must dance, dance, until the liquidity stops. I mean, this was a crime against finance. It was obvious. Uh, the market looked through it. The examiners must have looked through it. Citibank, to me, is a token of all that is wrong with American finance, which is plenty. Its bailout is, I think, a, a, a deep mark of Cain against our so-called financiers. Uh, the degree of incompetence, of sheer ignorance on the part of our financial elite is astounding and has not yet been called to account. Whether Citibank is too big to fail, I don't know. but. Its state of affairs is a scandal. And now what we have is a state of high statism in banking. The government now is the employer of first resort. I suppose it's the, the lead director. Um, uh, and we are meant to think that this is a good thing. And indeed, the stock market rallies. Uh, it is a bad thing. And it will be seen as such uh, not too many fiscal quarters from now. Harold, let's take it global. Um, <laughs> By the way, Jim, I hope my own local city ATM is part of the good city. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I haven't found that out yet, but I hope it is. I almost went to my ATM to pull everything out this morning until I read the news that uh, we had some rather large guarantees coming down the pike. But Harold, to go global, it, uh, some people have said that the problems we have here, serious as they are, are not going to be as bad as those in the emerging <coughs> markets uh, and are not going to be as bad as in Europe, where, for example, if we do, and we'll come to the automobile companies in a minute, if we were to bail out our big three, uh, it's a pretty sure bet that European automobile companies will have to go and seek the same kind of address from their governments. Uh, but give us some flavor for, for how this is playing out uh, around the globe. Yep, I, I mean, I certainly have that view that um, this is extremely unpleasant here, uh, but it's much, much more unpleasant in many, many parts of the world, uh, emerging markets, uh, but also in Europe. And I think the bailout discussion actually points us in exactly that direction, uh, because the Europeans have a much greater difficulty in dealing with their banks than we do, because we have a federal government. Um, but in Europe, there are banks that are active across the national frontiers. There are really big banks that are bigger than countries, which are really hard, uh, hard to rescue in the way that Citibank um, uh, is, is being dealt with. Um, and at the same time, there's really no institution uh, that can deal with them in the European framework, even though for 15, 20, I mean, even 30 years, really, people who've been thinking about the gradual progress of European monetary unification, of the unification of the European capital market, have pointed to this as, as, as a sore point. But the, the problem is that a, a bailout is a fiscal exercise. It requires the intervention of the taxpayer. We need to take a loss uh, for a moment. Um, and the, the budget of the European Union is really very, very tiny. It's, it's just over 1% of European GDP. Uh, so that they can't possibly deal with this on a European level. It falls back to the, the individual countries. And as a result, they're, they're involved in a kind of competition to provide different solutions. Ireland produces one solution that because its banks are particularly problematical. Then there's a surge of uh, deposits towards Ireland. And um, you, you're, you're ending up paying much more 
uh, both in terms of bailouts and in terms of the length of the crisis than you would have done if there had been a European capacity uh, to provide a, a Europe-wide uh, solution. And in that sense, Europe today is more like the United States was in the Great Depression when, at the time of the Great Depression, the federal government was also very, very small and couldn't do very much, whereas we can do things uh, today. If you think that's true of Europe, you should think of the emerging markets because they're even more on their own. Um, the emerging markets that are in the European Union, places like Hungary or the Baltic Republics, are r really lucky that they're there. At least there's something that will look after some bits of them. Uh, but if you're thinking of Central Asia, um, if you're thinking of Ukraine, um, if you're thinking of Pakistan, it's, it's really hard to, to envisage who's going to help them. And we don't have the right kind of mechanism at the moment to deal with those problems. You know, another <clears throat> aspect of the global story, though, which is raised by Martin Wolf in his book, uh, is China. A lot of people are saying China's going to come out of this better than anybody. Yes, their exports are being hurt, but their finances are in pretty good shape. They've got a ton of ca cash, about $3 trillion in foreign reserves, and that more and more they're going to be looked at uh, as maybe having a model that ought to be followed rather than dismissed. Martin Wolf, as you point out in your review, says, hey, slow down. It, the American system is still the better. Uh, it's been mismanaged, perhaps. And that the Chinese system of a state-controlled economy to a great extent is really the demon in all of this, that it's the way they have behaved over the last few years that has as much as anything else to do with the crisis we're now having to deal with. Um, would you elaborate on that a little? Yeah. I, I mean, Martin Wolf, uh, who's written a really very interesting book that was clearly prepared and uh, in press long before the current wave of the financial crisis hit, um, has, has <coughs> a really quite powerful argument. And it is, I think, uh, uh, it's, not, it's not an insane one. It's based on the story of the analysis of the, of the macroeconomic fundamentals that, um, uh, that that is the big accumulation of reserves in China. Um, so that Unlike many people, and I'm actually surprised how little finger-pointing there's been in the recent exercise, unlike many people, uh, Martin Wolf sees, uh, sees China and other uh, big emerging market economies with big current account surpluses um, as, the, as the real villains um, in, in, in this. Um, I, 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 I think that's, uh, that's going too far. I mean, I think uh, if you're trying to explain this crisis, you have to think of the monetary conditions in the United States. You have to think of the stories that... Uh, we, we heard from Jim about the, the uh, way that the financial system innovated and innovated much too much and innovated itself uh, into a really crazy situation. Um, uh, but it, it does seem to me that uh, Martin Wolf's book has a really important point in that um, you know, what, what's happened over the last 10 years is that there are many, many emerging markets that have done very well, have grown, have got a big middle class, are capable of working in the, in, in the world market. And they're saving at high rates, and they're going to continue to produce savings. So if we're thinking of where the solutions will come from, uh, when we're thinking also of the recapitalization of financial institutions, we really should think of these powerful centers of surplus accumulation with their very, very large middle classes, which are going to stay, I, I, I think, unless something really, really catastrophic happens, in which case you're in a, in a geopolitical <coughs> nightmare. But I, if that doesn't happen, uh, this is still going to be the center of, of surpluses and, uh, and really an important resource for the world economy. Yeah, I want to move on in just a minute to sort of the midterm. What are some of the things that we need to be considering doing about the international financial system and so on? But first, there's one more big item on the agenda right now, and that's the big three automobile companies in this country. And Jim and Roger, I think you all have slightly different views on what should be done about this. I'm oversimplifying, but bailout versus bankruptcy. Jim, you want to start it off? Uh, <coughs> living in Brooklyn, so far from Detroit, I favor bankruptcy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and on principle. Uh, it seems to me that, uh, that failure is as important a part of the life of a living economy as a success. Um, Japan provides an all too sad and vivid case study in the unintended consequences of, of uh, kind of promiscuous sentimentality in the saving of outfits that ought not to be around. So when 
the government, with all good intentions, rescues a big dying business. Um, it is immediately reinforced with the gratitude of those it has saved. Uh, the voters like it. The state of Michigan is, uh, is, is, is just transported, as it were. Um, <laughs> Uh, what is unseen is the opportunity cost of that intervention. Uh, the business that didn't get started by entrepreneurs that would have had an opportunity save for the continuing existence of the unworthy big uh, uh, old business. Uh, so, you know, we Americans have this great capacity to fail and recover from fail. We fail, we reprice, we get up in the morning, we try something else. It's almost a unique in that regard among the big countries in the world. And we ought to have more capacity, we have more confidence, I think, in our ability to rebound from bad decisions and to reprice those failings and to go on with the next thing. And I think that the, the move to intervene and bail out Detroit um, runs against that grain of national greatness. Roger, the Congress seems to, and, and Obama, seems to have made it quite clear <clears throat> that unless the auto companies come back with a plan to really remake themselves inside out, green and all sorts of other things, they're not going to get the bailout. Now, that's a tall order when you take in the UAW, plus all the suppliers, plus the dealers. And a lot of agreements have to be forged very quickly if this is to come off. You are somewhat optimistic, I think. Well, I was just thinking that's about That's not too Jim, strong a word. Thinking, no, I was just thinking about Jim's eloquent words, and I was thinking to myself, <clears> as CEO of an investment bank, I've gotten up every morning for the last year and a half, and everything I've tried hasn't worked. So It's going to be great for you, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think the point that, that uh, the President-elect made and a number of others have made is the right point, namely that it, it's not right for the federal government to provide assistance unless it's, there's a clear path to its, right. to its being successful, and success would mean that it actually bridges these companies through to viability. Now, uh, we've had a whole series of precedents, although none quite uh, none that recent, but certainly the Chrysler Loan Guarantee Act of 1979 and then really the New York City Loan Guarantee Act of 1978 were both clear precedents. And in those cases, and I think this is what they're tying it to, Jim, uh, painstaking negotiations occurred where all of the key constituents, lenders, suppliers, labor, uh, in, in, in the case of Chrysler state governments, uh, and in some case uh, actually foreign entities, uh, all ponied up, made concessions, which had, were quanti financially come on quantity. Right. And then the federal government's role, in effect, was the, was the final and provider, the provider of last resort. I think that's the framework they're talking about, and I think it's going to have to be that way. Uh, and whether that means that there'll be an, an interim loan, say six months, which then provides enough time for those negotiations to occur, uh, uh, and those But the interim loan would be based on, by about December 8th, them making at least a plausible case that they're going to get the job done in terms of a real plan. I think they'd have to outline the elements of that right. plan and, and the, the way that these concessions would be framed, and then, in effect, ask for enough time, which is months, <laughs> to negotiate them. Uh, and that's why I think, given the severity of the liquidity crisis, that you might see, and I have no special information here, but you might see uh, a multi-month loan could come from the Federal Reserve, for example, mm -hmm. uh, to just simply give them enough time to uh, uh, organize the type of multifaceted plan, as I just described, which right. would be uh, seen and actually would be a path to viability. Now. Of course, the other alternative, which Jim talked about, is allow them to file for bankruptcy and let the federal government be the debtor in possession lender, as the professionals say, uh, and allow the bankruptcy process to wring those concessions out. Because in bankruptcy, of course, for example, the $30 billion or so of unsecured debt that General Motors has would, uh, would suddenly be at, at risk. I mean, General Motors would not be obliged to service that debt. Right. And the contracts that General Motors has for <coughs> retire, retiree health and medical, which are enormous, would not be required to be met, and so forth. So theoretically, you could do this out of court, restructure it out of court, or restructure it in court. 
I suspect that the uh, uh, political powers that be will prefer the former because there's always risks in bankruptcy whether or not you can actually succeed in reorganizing it and whether, for mm -hmm. example, the customers remain with the company buy, yeah. given the multiplicity of choices they have. But theoretically, you could do it one way or the other. I should say in full disclosure, our firm works with General Motors and I work with General Motors myself, so I don't want uh, to fail to say that. But uh, uh, I think there will be federal intervention and the question is what form it will take rather than whether it will happen. Anybody here work with Ford or Chrysler? <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> in the interest of time, I've got a bunch of questions on what we should do about it. I'm going to wrap them up into one because I want to get to you all very quickly. There are lots of suggestions around now. We need a Bretton Woods II to completely redo the international financial structure to less expansive recommendations for tighter measures on uh, such things as capital and liquidity standards. Um, there's a thought that those elsewhere in the world are going to have a price tag for what we have done, so to speak, such as expanding the G7, uh, changing the role of the IMF to be uh, more uh, controlling than it is of such things as currency reserves. Let me just go down the panel here quickly and just say, what is the one or two key things you think we ought to be doing in the midterm now, not the crisis of the next 60 days, uh, given what has happened? Roger, you want to start? Well, number one, expand the IMF. Uh, uh, expand it both financially and expand it in terms of who plays what role. Uh, the world's wealthiest country, which by standards of reserve, perhaps not, uh, well, not output, but by standards of, of finance, is China. And China should play a larger role in the IMF. That would require a, a redo of the shareholder system and the quota system and so forth at the IMF, but it would be uh, appropriate under, this, under the circumstances and in order to uh, bring this such, this such an important nation into a more leadership, into a bigger leadership role. Uh, as far as a real Bretton Woods II is concerned, uh, which at the time meant, among other things, a managed system of exchange rates, or actually a bank fixed exchange rate. Right. The, the days for that are over. Uh, the, the system of world finance is too big. The foreign exchange markets are too big. We can't go back to that. That that's that's really impractical. And I would also add that th that the idea of a single system, even a single Western system of financial regulation, uh, is also, I think, unworkable, because the needs and the uh, challenges in, in, in these areas are too different. Too different. different. Yeah. The idea <clears throat> of having, for example, one regulator for Europe and the U.S., I think is uh, uh, just an unworkable idea. Jim, you talked about the need to get back to fixed exchange rates and to... A I didn't know what Roger was going to say when I... <laughs> I, know, I know. And a reserve currency that is tied to gold or to some commodity. Yes. Like that. And... Uh, 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 to start with the world as it is, this country, the United States, uh, uh, consumes much more than it produces and it finances the difference every year with the emission of dollar bills into the world's payment stream. Now, this emission runs from $600 billion to $800 billion. In any case, um, a lot of money, even when you say it fast. And, and we have lived with the, with the glorious exception to the rule that you can't do that. We are the exception. We are the exception because the world gladly accepts our dollar bills, and not only does it accept them, but it also reinvests them in our securities so it's as if they'd never left home. And I think, Roger, the people who insist that this system can't be changed or that it mustn't be because it is too ingrained, I think, assume a great deal on the part of the confidence and, um, uh, and the patience of our creditors. Uh, they have absorbed hundreds of billions of dollars worth of obligations of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which institutions are now in federal conservatorship. Uh, they have been the customers of our uh, financial experimentation with structured mortgage products. Uh, and we ask them every year to absorb hundreds of billions of dollars more of dollars, the intrinsic value of which is zero. Um, it seems to me that one idea for the medium term is just to expand our imaginations and to reacquaint ourselves with the rules that preceded uh, Richard Nixon's decision to go off gold in 1971, to go off the last remnant of what had been a gold standard. And it was a very feeble one at that. But I think that we ill serve ourselves if we continue to assume without reflection that the world will ever 
be ever ready to absorb our dollars and invest those dollars in our securities. It seems to me the height of national conceit. I, I'd be really worried about uh, getting back to a fixed exchange rate system, I must say. I mean, it seems to me that that's one of the big differences with the world of the Great Depression, and that's an analogy that people seem to be making a great deal. But one of the things about the Great Depression was exactly that the fixed exchange rate system worked like a perfect transmission mechanism for trans uh, transmitting uh, deflation from one country uh, to another. That's not to say that you can't have crises with floating exchange rates, but you know, if you imagine what Iceland would have been like with a, with a fixed currency or what the UK would be like with a fixed currency um, at the moment, uh, those scenarios would be much, much worse th th than, than they are. Um, I, I agree with the, with the point that Roger made about the, um, the, the fundamental reform of the IMF. It does seem to me that this is the, the first uh, major crisis since the Second World War in which the IMF has been largely on the sidelines in the, in the lead up to the crisis and in the initial stages of it. It's now emerging as, as part of the solution for some of the emerging market crises, but it's going to find its financial resources quite quickly uh, constrained because uh, uh, up to now the problem was that it wasn't lending enough, uh, but now the problem is that there will be too many people uh, queuing up. So we really do need to find a way of, of getting uh, China or other emerging markets involved much more centrally and much more quickly. And I think if you look at the mechanism that's led to the current proposal for a very, very modest set of quota increases, uh, you can really see that this, uh, this has been much, much too slow. And people in China will say this again and again, that this really isn't going to do the job. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think as a result, uh, you've got to think of some kind of mechanism that does some of the things that were done, say, in the 1970s when the fund uh, borrowed from the Middle Eastern oil producers from the Saudis. But then you've got to also think of ways in which that borrowing um, from China and from other emerging market surplus economies will really be translated into an effective voice in, in the fund. And I, I, I would think a much more fundamental rejigging of the voting system would be needed to do that. Okay, the last question for me, and then I'm going to the audience. When I do, put your hand up. If I call on you, please stand up, identify yourself, and wait for the mic. And we have people around the room with microphones ready to get to you rather quickly. My last question is to Roger Altman, <clears throat> who has the lead piece in our next issue, The Great Crash of 2008. Now, when you write for foreign affairs, you have to really have most of the work done six to eight weeks sometimes before we go before you publicly see the magazine. And that's usually not a problem, but when, when you have a rolling stone of this size, it's not easy. And what Roger and I agreed he should do was to try and extrapolate from our current crisis what are some of the longer term geopolitical and geoeconomic, if you will, implications, likelihoods. And uh, the, uh, some of them, uh, I think, are mildly depressing. But Roger, it's all yours. Well, I, I argue in the piece, uh, and I'm grateful that you <laughs> took it, uh, I argue in the piece that uh, this crash is a meaningful geopolitical setback for the United States and really for the Western model of, of, of finance. Uh, and it is that because uh, there's a connection, a cl I think a strong connection, between the powerful appeal of, let's call it the U.S. model of free market capitalism in, in the past 20 or 25 years, a powerful appeal of that around the world, and indeed the spread of democracy. And now that system of free market capitalism is seen as having uh, failed. We can debate whether it's a huge failure or a small failure or a very long-term failure or just a medium-term failure, but it's seen as having failed. Uh, the financial system is collapsed, and I think there's no debate about that. Uh, we've seen a scale of intervention, government intervention, which to many, many people is antithetical to the tenets of modern capitalism. Uh, and you've heard comments already from people like President Sarkozy, who said laissez-faire et fini or the vice premier of China who has said, quote, now the teacher has some problems, unquote, classic Chinese understatement. Uh, 
<coughs> but I think the uh, uh, much of the influence and soft power of the United States was rooted in the economic in the success in its economic success and the great appeal of its economic model. Now, after some period of time, we will recover and we will be repaired. And I don't mean to imply that this is a permanent failure. It's not. But for the medium term, it's a geopolitical setback and I think a meaningful one. Now, uh, there won't be many around the world who benefit from this crisis. We've talked already about the developing world and so many victims in the developing world. And you can already see the line in front of the IMF, which is stretching quite long already and will get longer, for classic IMF-style emergency, uh, uh, emergency rescues. But there will be uh, uh, one or two nations, most notably China, which, relatively speaking, do benefit. Uh, China will suffer much less than, than, the, than the U.S. and much less than Europe from an economic point of view. Yes, its growth rate will slow. Yes, its growth rate may slow meaningfully, but it will still experience growth which the rest of the world would, en will, would envy, will envy. Uh, and, of course, it has the strongest financial position in the world. And the result will be an opportunity for China, and I expect them to take it cautiously and conservatively rather than aggressively, but nonetheless an opportunity for China, really w by w without doing very much at all, to expand its influence and to play a more strategic role, particularly in the rest of Asia, but actually around the world. It can do that uh, as a uh, financier. It can do that as investor. It can do that merely by pointing uh, quietly to the advantages of the Chinese model uh, 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 over this uh, Anglo-Saxon model, if you call it that, which has just uh, failed so spectacularly. So that's the thrust, or one of the thrusts. But it doesn't necessarily have to be a particularly adversarial competition. It's just they're going to have stronger cards to play, even if relatively benignly. In fact, I, I would guess that the new administration will come to see China, our new administration, <clears throat> will come to see China as its most important bilateral relationship and actually that this crisis could promote a closer and more cooperative relationship between the U.S. and China because these are emerging, or not emerging, these are uh, increasingly evident as, as the two most important nations and powerful nations on earth. And uh, uh, I think with the fresh slate that our administ new administration will have, uh, and the difficulties on the one hand we just discussed and the yeah. advantages that China presents, it, may, it lays the groundwork or framework for what could be a closer working relationship rather than a more distant one. Roger, thank you for finding a little glimmer of light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> hey, we need that. Questions? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Right over here. And the uh, mic is coming your way. Tina Bennett, Jankla Nesbitt. Um, my question is, who rescues the rescuer? I'm worried about the federal government, and I'm concerned that there seems to be so little analytical debate about the limit of the federal government to metabolize toxic assets. Given that our financial institutions and our political leaders seem to be so unwilling or unable to address themselves to worst case scenarios, should, don't we need to pause and consider that now? Uh, I thought of it particularly the other day when I was at my local bank and saw the shelf flyer uh, explaining the FDIC insurance, saying this is backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government, and I actually choked up and thought, what if we get to a point where that doesn't mean what it used to mean? Very good question. Jim, you want to take that one? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, uh, the U.S. government is an enterprise that, uh, that spends or is going to spend $3.5 trillion and will take in $2.5 trillion about in this fiscal year. Um, before the crisis, uh, it was uh, upgraded by the General Accountability Office for having misplaced about $60 billion in the accounts. About 11 years in a row, GAO can't audit the, can't give a, uh, an auditor's opinion on the government's accounts because they are rather a mess. So that was a state of affairs before the massive intervention. Um, now, Whoever it was who said there's a lot of ruin in the nation spoke to calamity howlers like me 
uh, one must be careful about jumping too quickly to the conclusion that this math doesn't work. Math doesn't work, and yet we go on. Um, however, <laughs> the dollar, it seems to me, is, 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 the, is the question. Um, now, uh, the Federal Reserve prints them. And you can listen to the Federal Reserve's speeches, but you're mostly advised to, to look at its balance sheet. It's a bank and uh, has assets and liabilities. Liabilities are dollar bills. And it creates them in plain sight. It discloses the results every Thursday, 4.30. Um, around Labor Day, the Fed's balance sheet floated to about $965 billion. Today, it's about $2.5 trillion in round numbers. Um, never before has the Fed done what it's doing now. And I think never before has the world been quite so sanguine about a central bank doing what the Fed is doing now. Uh, this is an extraordinary exercise. If the Fed wanted to be like the Reichsbank in Weimar, Germany, it'd be doing what it's doing now. So to me, there's a, there's a clear and present danger surrounding not only the dollar, but also other paper currencies. The, 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 the Bank of England is expanding much faster than the Fed. These, these numbers look like typos. The Bank of England has year-over-year -year expansion of its assets about 200%, a little less than that maybe. Extraordinary. Um, so the world over, central banks are printing money as if it were going out of style. Now, the thinking I think in the central banking circles is if they all do it, nobody will notice. <laughs> so that's where the gold price comes in. That's, that is the telltale. That is, the, that is what will signal that the world is losing the confi its confidence in the institution of managed currencies and in the, in the mortal human beings that would pretend to know the right interest rate and the right amount of money. It seems to me that there, we're coming up to a crisis of managed currencies, not merely of the dollar, but certainly the dollar itself is, is in, a very, in a very dramatic juncture. So, you know, this is a great country. It is, uh, its strengths are, are like too numerous to mention in a short speech. Uh, but it issues a currency, the value of which intrinsically is nothing. It is faith-based. And, and the risk to me now is that this massive kind of across the aisle, um, uh, you know, bipartisan embrace of statism is going to result in a terrific inflation once things settle down. So I hope I'm wrong a, a little bit. <laughs> But that, that to me is, that those, I mean, it's, it's not as if this country is going broke. This country is producing so many dollars that one must begin to wonder. Al, we got a question from one of our members in Lawrence, Kansas, Karatan Bahala. And uh, it's a tough question. Should we stop bailing our, out our financial institutions? And should we allow the markets to adjust no matter how savage? Well, I, I, I think uh, we, we saw what happened when you tried to do that with the uh, with the failure to to bail out Lehman's. Um, that uh, you know this was exactly that bold experiment in doing that measure. Um, and if you remember the immediate aftermath of that that weekend on the Monday morning, uh, there were plenty of people from a, a classically European style liberal uh, background, a free economy background, who, who cheered that. But it clearly didn't work. Um, and I think in, in, in the current circumstances, uh, we really don't have much choice. But we have to worry um, about what the long-term consequences of this are, because the, the, the story of the uh, governments moving into credit markets and taking over banks, um, and also I think there's more and more a call, because you know, even with the recapitalization of banks, uh, it isn't getting the credit market started up again. So there's going to be a call for governments to press for particular lending, and that's going to be quite politicized. Um, and th this can, in the long run, uh, really be quite disastrous. The, 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 the most striking example of this, I think, is in Italy, where the government took over the banks in the 1930s and then created a bad bank of exactly the same kind that's being uh, talked about now with reference to Citibank. And this managed Italy's industrial assets for the next 50 years and managed them very, very badly. Um, so we really have to make sure uh, that what we're doing is a short-term measure and that we have a good exit strategy uh, for, from that short-term measure. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm Arturo Porsekensky with American University. When the uh, dot-com bubble burst, 
no major financial institutions went under because they didn't own the paper and the securities issued by the dot-coms. But this time, when the asset-backed securitization bubble burst, we found out that institutions that were supposed to underwrite trade and distribute away from themselves uh, this paper were major owners. That's the problem. Why? Why? What, what went wrong? <laughs> Who would like to tackle that one? <laughs> Does that mean, is that a yes or a no? Right. There we go. That's a re reference to Jim's tim timid city group of 1857. <laughs> <coughs> uh, it's awfully hard to answer that question briefly. Uh, but first of all, there's no comparison between the dot-com bubble and the, and, the, and the bursting of that in 2000 and the uh, credit market bubble and the bursting of that in 06, well, in, in 07. Uh, one was, first of all, one was small, one was an equity-based situation. Uh, and this, this, this is vastly larger and, as we all know, credit-based. Uh, and in the former, a bunch of equity investors lost a whole bunch of money, and that's the risk of investing in equities. Uh, and it came and it went, and while the NASDAQ has never recovered, the earlier levels of the NASDAQ were probably, of course, uh, never going to be repeated anyway. Uh, as far as how this happened is concerned, I'll just try to give a very short answer. Uh, a lot of people say that it happened because the housing market collapsed, and I argue with this piece that Foreign Affairs is publishing that that's an, an incorrect assessment. It happened, I believe, for the, re the reasons of the two factors that Jim briefly mentioned at the beginning of this session, namely a combination, an invariably lethal combination, of very low interest rates for quite a long period of time, coupled with the, quote, global savings glut in Chairman Bernanke's phrase, which Jim referred to in terms of developing countries which historically had been ex importers of capital, turning out to be very, very large exporters of capital led by China. And so you had very, very low interest rates, mountains of liquidity disintermediating, disintermediating themselves into the United States. And of course, uh, the combination produced this relentless search for higher returns, and the higher returns meant weaker credits and searching out weaker credits from subprime mortgages to every imaginable form of weaker credit. And by the way, there are two ways to make a credit weak. One is just weak, and the other is you leverage it up to the point that it becomes weak. <laughs> and uh, uh, of course, masses of, massive, massive amounts of this liquidity went into weak credits. Historical, long, very long-term historical rates of default were ignored, as they often always are in bubble-like euphoria. And ultimately, as would always happen, uh, it collapsed upon itself. That's essentially what happened. Now, there's a, a, a five-hour version of that answer and a two-week version of that answer. <laughs> and then there'll be the hundreds of books, which are already in process, already in process about this, which will provide much longer answers. But that's a short one. Thanks. Back. Yes, ma'am. There's a hand up over here. Yes. <coughs> Thank you. What will be the mechanism for um, accounting for uh, banks and those assets that have been off the book, these uh, uh, credit default swaps and that? Where will that come from, at least in the United States? Jim? Sir, can you be more specific as to what uh, what kind of accounting question is it exactly? I, I understood that um, uh, credit default swaps uh -huh. uh, assets were not necessarily on balance sheets and standard accounting practices for some of these banks. Well, I think uh, uh, to the regret of many of the institutions, they are. Uh, <laughs> Um, they're all too visible on, on, on many balance sheets. You know, they now feel like AIG will undertake to guarantee um, a, a part of a mortgage that is stamped AAA and therefore without risk, and it will uh, write that guarantee, and, and that guarantee will be on balance sheet. And when the mortgage turns out not to be so AAA, uh, the loss will be will be evident and will be reflected in reduced shareholders' equity and reduced profitability. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I want to wait for the mic, please. Hanya Kim, Intrepid International. 
An answer to that, the credit default swaps are actually tra giving us a pretty good measure of prices right now. They're trading fairly liquidly. So those are trading at market. You're referring to the mortgage-backed securities and so on and the discussion of whether they should be marked to market. Marked to market is what can I sell this for now, which is probably the only rational way to price it. Some people have been talking about maybe giving somebody a little bit more for them because they feel bad. <laughs> but the credit default swaps are providing a really good gauge right okay, now. Okay, way in the back, on the left. Yeah, D Danny Schechter with Global Vision. To what extent do you believe that criminal activity played in all this? The FBI is investigating 26 companies. They've indicted 400 people. They've opened 1,400 cases. We're told they would do more if, they, if their ranks hadn't been cut uh, by the Bush administration. To what degree is fraud, misrepresentation, and other crimes involved in this? Well, that's a nice, meaty question. Harold, let's start at your end. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I, I, I think uh, you're, you're absolutely right, but um, one of the things about uh, the, uh, the emergence of a sudden downturn uh, is that you find out all kinds of unpleasant things uh, that you wouldn't find out if the prosperity bubble continued to go on. And so uh, people who have fraudulent schemes can go on multiplying pyramids as long as the, uh, the, the, the Chuck Prince phrase about continuing to dance. Uh, applies to the criminal world as well. Um, but uh, you, you know, now when it collapses, I think you do, you do actually see the consequences of it. But uh, there's, there's, a, there's a downturn, uh, downside of this as well, uh, that I think uh, you know, as, as you move into a world that's more economically insecure, uh, you also get a new kind of criminality that okay. emerges out of this because then uh, criminal gangs will say that they offer a kind of protection um, that uh, traditional institutions and traditional states uh, can't really give. Garrett. Garrett Gutley, Levin Institute. Do we now live in the era of the G20? If so, what happens to the G7? It's been suggested <coughs> the G7 is little more, although it would be important, than the uh, rich nations caucus within the G20. Um, at the last meeting, they agreed to meet again no later than April 30th, which I believe, if we count the calendar, will be the 101st day of the Obama administration. What, in your view, do you think has to be accomplished or can be accomplished by April 30th at that meeting in the world of the G20? Yes, go ahead. But, um, well, Garrick, I think, first of all, the G G7 is obsolete. Uh, it's obsolete because of its membership. Its membership is a membership of 20 years ago or earlier and not really reflective of uh, who carries wh what weight internationally now in economic and financial terms. So how can you have a group like that without China uh, and arguably uh, uh, India? So I think it's obsolete and uh, I would think that, that, the, that the G7 should meet less and the G20 should meet more. Uh, as to what can be accomplished between now and April 20th, I think if they're seeking a Bretton Woods II, not, the answer is not much. Uh, but I think if they're seeking, for example, to uh, reinvigorate, as I said before, and enlarge the IMF, you could accomplish quite a bit. And a lot will depend, of course, on what, the, uh, what impetus or lack of it the United States gives to it, the new administration. Yes. Irene Meister. Uh, I address it to the whole panel because everyone has mentioned in one way or in the other China, but no one mentioned the role of Russia and where they're going to move. And they have a lots of control after all still in, over their currency and their activities. I wonder if you would care to comment where that country will come in. Okay. Powell? Yeah, I, I mean, R R Russia, I think, is, is a much more terrifying version of what one of the responses to this economic crisis uh, c can be. Uh, we've already seen uh, last week, um, now Prime Minister Putin um, said that uh, in the case when the international financial system has so clearly failed, uh, we in Russia need to renationalize our financial system and we need to 
uh, go and control enterprises and uh, we're, we're going to take over assets, including presumably the assets of foreign companies with which Russia has been engaged in, 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 in disputes for, for a considerable period of time. So, um, you know, I, th I think uh, when you compare the R Russia and China side of the reaction, you see in China, and I, I, I agreed very much with, uh, with what Roger said, a very benign uh, version of playing with power in a world that values power now much more than it values markets. Uh, but <coughs> in Russia, you see a much less benign version of, of, of that and a much more aggressive one in which things like the control of energy resources, the control of the, of the state enterprises uh, will be used for very, very naked power political purposes. But Harold, the, um, um, Russia is also much more fragile than China, is it not, economically? I mean, it's $50 a barrel for oil. They're in deep trouble in terms of the budget, are they not? Yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's fragile in the same way as some of the uh, Middle Eastern oil right. producers are fragile. Uh, but that seems to me to make it more likely to be very aggressive um, no, than less likely to be very aggressive. So okay, we have time for probably bad. just a couple of more questions. We'll start over here in the corner. And then back. Canada, I'm Golden Tree. Um, there is uh, right now in the credit markets a negative feedback. Lower prices, if you get lower prices, it's going to be tougher to, re to refinance. How do you reverse that? And uh, what, what to be looking for? The second question is, do you think at the end of the day the euro survives, given competing interest? Who would like to take one or two? You, Jim. Um, as for the credit market, it seems to me that what, uh, you know, there's a, there's a saying in the commodity markets that, uh, that the cure for low prices is low prices and the cure for high prices is high prices. Uh, when, when value finally becomes evident and manifest, I think it seems to me that people uh, will buy this stuff. I mean, the Wall Street Journal has a stock phrase now, super safe treasuries, toxic mortgages. Our headline recently was toxic treasuries, super safe mortgages, because there's no inherently good or bad bond, right? It's all at a price. Yeah. Um, there's no, no bad bonds, just bad prices. So the price mechanism itself will assure that things get started again if we would only allow it to work. Um, as for um, the euro, it is the emission of a confederacy, and we all know what happens to confederate money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in the back, in the center. Uh, Peter Kedden, Princeton University. Uh, much has been said about the role of the fund. Uh, but my understanding is that the fund has uncommitted resources uh, of under uh, a billion dollars, much less than that. Uh, the one thing that the C20 or G20 did not do was to talk about borrowing arrangements for the fund. Uh, would you agree, uh, Mr. Altman, that that is a high priority uh, and uh, should essentially be uh, undertaken by the new administration. The existing borrowing arrangements are only for and by the G7 countries. Uh, and the clients of the fund now are many more. Well, first of all, it's always a pleasure to be asked a question by you, Peter, so thank you. Uh, but yes, I would entirely agree with your point. Entirely agree. That was simple. <laughs> that gives us time for one more question. Yes, right there. Thank you. I'm Deborah Perry, and I sit on several corporate boards. Uh, what shall we do about the rating agencies? Uh -huh. Jim has to ask that. Jim, Jim hmm? has to answer that. Yeah, it's Jim. just that Jim answered that. <laughs> Put your helmets on. <laughs> um, it seems to me that, uh, uh, that simply defederalizing them uh, might help. As it is, they, uh, they spoke. Uh, with the authority of the federal government because they were sanctioned by the Securities and Exchange Commission. And their pronouncements were written into the regulatory apparatus of the international banking uh, system. Uh, so by, by, by stripping them of, of their governmental garb, uh, they are reduced to a bunch of people sitting around in a room having an opinion, which is what newspapers do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Uh, there's nothing wrong with, with people, you know, 
vouchsafing an opinion for pay as long as that's disclosed and people know what it means and what it doesn't mean. The trouble is that their judgments uh, were sanctified in some way through, um, through their being chartered and blessed by the federal uh, government. And I think that was the root of the problem. Um, you know, they, they, they didn't know any more about the math of these, these science projects, these mortgage contraptions, than anybody else did as it's now coming to light. And um, if there'd been more competition and less federal blessing, it seems to me that fact would have been known much sooner. I'm going to thank you all for joining us tonight in this, our second session. <laughs> and I hope you'll join us uh, the next time we do this. But right now, please help me thank our panelists, who I thought were so good. Thank you for watching this Council on Foreign Relations video. For additional audio, video, and transcripts of CFR meetings, as well as expert analysis of international news, please visit us online at CFR.org.